Thank you and welcome, my father, Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. And we've got two great guests tonight that we'll get into in a little bit. But first, as many of you know, when the recent Health and Human Services contraception mandate came down from the Obama administration, threatening the religious freedom of Catholics and Catholic institutions, EWTN was the first Catholic organization to file suit against the federal government in an effort to prevent the administration from forcing Catholics and Christians and others alike to compromise their consciences regarding birth control funding within insurance programs. Joining us tonight to give us a brief update on EWTN's position regarding the recently proposed accommodation put forth by the Obama administration is the president and CEO of EWTN, Mr. Michael Warsaw. Michael, welcome. Thanks, Good to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What, what is going on right now with, with this accommodation that they're trying to come up with and all? Sure. Well, um, as you mentioned in your, in your lead-in, uh, EWTN on Thursday of last week, the 9th, uh, filed suit in federal court here in Birmingham uh, against Secretary Sibelius and the Department of Health and Human Services, really challenging this, this mandate uh, on constitutional grounds as a violation of the network's right of free speech and free exercise of religion. Uh, there was much made, of course, in the secular media about then the president's announced accommodation on Friday, uh, the day after we filed suit. And in that accommodation, he said that the Catholic institutions don't have to pay for the contraception and abortifacients, but the insurance companies do. Right. He, he essentially made a, a, an accounting game out of this, that, that he shifted the burden uh, for some religious institutions uh, to the insurance companies, in fact, ordering the, that the insurance companies would be uh, required to provide this coverage without cost and, and outside of the plans. Uh, one of our bloggers on the National Catholic Register side had a great analogy. He said it's, it's a little bit like saying, well, you're 16 years old and you can't legally drink alcohol, so it's okay if you just give the money to your older brother and let him buy it for you. That's, that's you know, almost yeah, the right, kind of scenario right. that's, that's been created here. It really doesn't change anything. For, for organizations like EWTN that self-insure our health care coverage, uh, there's, no, there's no exemption and this doesn't apply. Uh, so really for us and many, many other institutions within the church, uh, we're left exactly after Friday's accommodation uh, in the same position that we were in uh, prior to that when we, when we filed suit. And that says nothing at all uh, and, and addresses nothing with regard to individual business owners uh, and other people of conscience who, who also object to this. Mm -hmm. exactly. Um, exactly. So, so the, the, the accommodation really was, was no accommodation. And as the bishops of uh, the United States have made clear that, that this uh, action is still unacceptable and there's really nothing short of a complete uh, act of rescinding this mandate that's really going to be acceptable. Exactly, exactly. This is where the um, executive branch of the government is making mandates that you know, are beyond, I think, you know, the, the realm of the Constitution. Exactly. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, the Constitution gives us the right to free exercise of our religion and that the government cannot interfere with that. That's correct. That's correct. And there's been much made, in, in, again, in the secular media of saying, well, this is a fight over contraception. You know, that, it's that's, not. that's not the position that EWTN has taken in our lawsuit uh, by any means. What, what we've said is this is a constitutional issue. This is about freedom of speech and freedom of religious expression. And we have a guarantee of that in our Constitution. And for the administration to come in and say, uh, well, essentially, EWTN, you know, during the day, you can preach all you want on television, uh, but you can't practice that. Right. Uh, you know, that is a violation of our constitutional rights. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So we're asking, uh, we're asking the courts to intervene in this, and uh, we're hopeful and, and very confident that the argument that our attorneys have put forward uh, will prevail at the end of the day, and, and uh, we'll get a review and, and an overturning of this, this unjust mandate. 
And, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm coming up with an article for the uh, National Catholic mm -hmm. Register mm -hmm. uh, in uh, another week and a half in which I point out this is not a new Catholic issue that just arose. Our condemnation of birth control and abortion go back to the first century mm -hmm. and every century ever after. This is consistent Catholic teaching, and this is why it's worth fighting for. Exactly. And, you know, I think one of the things that's been often misunderstood, and, and certainly in the reporting in the secular media, has been, well, this is an easy issue to compromise on. Well, it's precisely, as you say, because this is, uh, this is a core part of our teaching that goes back you know, to, to the early days of the church, mm -hmm. uh, it's not something we can compromise exactly. on. Exactly. It's not something that you can, you can reach a political solution to and have suddenly go away. We cannot, cannot compromise our beliefs on this. All right. Anything else? Well, I think uh, we certainly want our audience to continue to, to pray for us, to pray for this cause of action. Uh, it's important that our EWTN family uh, keep this in their, in their sacrifices and prayers. Um, I think secondly, it's important for our audience to continue to uh, support us with their donations as they have throughout these 30 years. I think it's clear that now more than ever, uh, our country, our world needs EWTN and its mission. And I think thirdly, uh, for people who may want to get more actively involved in this, if they go to the EWTN.com website, there's a, a banner there they'll see about this issue. Uh, you can click on that and that will take you to uh, the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberties. It's our law firm that's representing us in this. Um, and the Beckett Fund has a petition that people can sign to make it clear to the administration and to the Congress that this unjust mandate has to go. And they can also go to their local congressman and senator uh, and contact them directly if they wish. I've already done that. Yes, yes, absolutely. Very helpful. Right. And uh, we're hopeful that Congress will, will get involved in this in a very active way. Um, but, uh, you know, ultimately, we believe it'll be the courts that'll have to decide this for right. us. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, I appreciate Father. it. Uh, and after this, we're going to have a little break. We'll hear from two former Anglicans about how God led them into the Catholic Church. So please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome back. Joining us now on the set uh, from the All Saints Sisters of the Poor in Baltimore, Maryland. We have Sister Elaine Swan, though she's actually from Philadelphia, and also from St. Mary the Virgin Catholic Church, which is an Anglican youth parish in Arlington, Texas, Father Al Alan Hawkins. Please welcome them both. Sisters, welcome. <laughs> Father Hawkins. Well, it's great to get to you as our guest tonight. Um, we, we, uh, one of the things that's very distinctive, you belong to a religious community, but uh, you've been a nun f from before you were Catholic. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, that's all my life, really. <laughs> I went into the, to the convent when I was 23 years old, so that's a good number of years now. But we realized that eventually we couldn't stay where we were. And so, that was in the Anglican Church. You were Anglican yes, nuns. Yes, and our order was um, 161 years uh, as Anglicans. And so we were already formed when we became Catholics. 
So we were formed as an order, so the church did not bring in, uh, make a new order from us. They just took us in as we were. And that makes us distinctive and unique and yeah. all of the rest of that. And then we're the only Anglican order that has done this. Okay. So that's... Well, that makes you unique. And there's no precedent for it. Uh, Rome said they haven't handled this problem in 500 years. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they didn't quite know what to do. So to like that play, what do you do with a problem like the sisters? <laughs> right. So the Archdiocese of Baltimore was a tremendous help. And the Archbishop himself is the one that led the whole process through. As a matter of fact, he's an Archbishop who was about to become a Cardinal, is he yes, not? Yes, 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 Saturday. Mm -hmm. Great. And Father Hawkins, uh, you also have a distinctive story. Um, tell us a little bit about your experience, because you also were an Anglican priest. An Anglican priest and the son of an Anglican priest in England. Um, I was ordained in the Church of England in 1960. Came to the United States and to the Episcopal Church in 1980, just 32 years ago, to the present parish, which was a parish of the Episcopal Diocese of Dallas in those days. Um, and after 10 years of teaching and thinking, praying what we should do, uh, in 1991, we left the Episcopal Church unanimously, virtually. Um, sister asked me a moment ago about whether there were any who didn't come. There were two who didn't. But the, the parish as a whole transferred with its property and everything else. And that was unique at the time, too. Right. Uh, into right. the Catholic Church. And in 1994, the parish was erected as a parish of the pastoral provision um, in the Diocese of Fort Worth. Okay, so, so this, now, you, that's one of the reasons that you two are very distinctive. A whole group of sisters come in and a whole parish comes in. Yes. And recently, uh, the Anglican usage ordinariate just had a celebration. You were there, I take it. I was there on Sunday at last in Houston at the Pro Cathedral. Um, and it was a glorious and wonderful event. Cardinal Donado of Houston and Cardinal Whirl, who had overseen the erection of the Ordinariate, were both there, uh, and both very gracious and supportive, um, but allowed the new ordinary, Monsignor Geoffrey Steenson, to take center stage. But the, the liturgy was Anglican in its ethos, the music was gloriously Anglican, and there was great <laughs> enthusiasm and enthusiasm for the whole thing. It was a wonderful occasion, yes it was. Oh, that's great, mm. that's great. You know, that's one of the things I've said to a number of Anglican converts is that we are looking forward to the new music coming in. You know, old music, uh, 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 well, old music <laughs> yes. actually, but yes. for us it'll be somewhat new, yes. uh, but, but quite good, better than yes. some of what we yes. hear in the recent compositions. Yes. Yes. The parish where I worked before used to do the Mozart masses. Oh, is that right? Orchestra, chorus. Mm -hmm. Wow, nice, nice. So that nice. comes in too. Yes, it does. Now, Sister, your community is a, a combination of active and contemplative, correct? Yes. Tell us a little bit about the work that you all do. Well, we're called a mixed community, and there's nothing like that in the Catholic Church. In the Catholic Church, you're either contemplative or you're active. But our is very, very different. And we are a monastic community. Okay. And with that, we have uh, daily mass, six divine offices a day, um, private prayer time for each sister, devotions and spiritual reading and Bible reading. And then in Advent and Lent, we do more meditations. And that's daily. And then on top of that, to be a mixed life, then we have some outside apostolates. What kind of apostolates does your community have? We have a hospice for the dying, and then we have um, a retreat house, and then each sister does individual things. Mm -hmm. so. so, so, so the very the variety of uh, apostolates that the community does. It's it's the retreat house and the hospice, and then we have a scriptorium. And w what's a scriptorium? It, one sister designs holy cards, makes holy cards. And then we have a small gift shop, but mostly that's a um, mail order business. Oh, I see. And it's a it's a good one, a good okay. mail order business. All right, mm -hmm. good. So so that's something to help keep the community going. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, great. What kind of work do you do in particular? I do a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but mostly um, I work with the homeless, 
and then I teach in a parish, um, Bible study. And then we have two spirituality groups that meet at our house. And then just recently we've started two discussion groups. And that's all I can do, I think. Okay, that sounds like enough. Now, one, one question I heard somebody ask you earlier today that may, might be of interest to our audience. Do people find it off-putting that you're in a full habit? Do they say, oh no, one of these nuns? Uh, do you find a negative reaction to wearing this habit? I only had one negative response, and, and that was um, years ago, really. And that's all I've had. The rest mm -hmm. of it has been very favorable. And the one response was from a homeless man who was sitting on a curb and he had a cup of coffee and he threw it at me. And he said, why doesn't God give me a job? And that was it. Uh -huh. The rest of it's been very favorable. And whenever I go to the grocery store, people will say, oh, it's so good to see your habit. Keep it on, keep going, you know, that kind of thing. Encouragement. Okay, so that's mm -hmm. most of the experience. Mm -hmm. The homeless guy should have realized that when God gives you employment, there's no pay. He <laughs> 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 might not have been so quick to ask. There is a relationship between me and the sisters, actually, because I was a priest associate of their order in London oh, is many, right? many years ago, in the 1960s. So, of course, when I came to this country, I was interested in making contact with the sisters in Baltimore. So there's been a long relationship there. Oh, that's very interesting. Now, I, I want to ask you a little bit about your parish ministry. Yes. Um, this is an Anglican youth parish. Are people who are Catholic but not Anglican youth allowed to come to Mass at your parish? Yes. Um, there's a distinction between membership of the parish and membership of the ordinariate. I mean, there are two separate things. But the, any, it's a Catholic parish, and any Catholic can worship with us and many do. Um, over the years, our mix has changed. It, has, uh, uh, it was predominantly ex-Anglican in the early days. It has become now uh, other things. People who come into the church via the Methodist church and so on have come into the Catholic mm -hmm. church through us. In fact, Father Steenson, the ordinary, um, said when he came to visit my parish many years ago, that he thought it would prove to be an accessible door into the church for many people who might find the other doors rather daunting. And that's why, proved to be the case. Yeah, it? why do you think that is? I don't know. I think for one thing, our parish is relatively small. Uh, Sunday attendance, 400, 450, something of that kind. And many of the parishes around us number in the thousands. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's a very different experience for many people who come from smaller communities, you know. Mm -hmm. but, and culturally, of course, the difference. Too. I was just going to ask, yeah. wh what about the cultural differences that that people experience at your parish? Um, what are some of the ways in which um, that cultural difference would make a number of other non-Catholics feel at home? Um, certainly hymnody, uh, which is an important part of Anglican worship. But, it, it, but we share that with Methodists, for example. Um, um, a, 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 uh, an affinity for an English langu linguistic style that relates to the King James Bible, to the uh, prayer book of Cranmer, the 1662 book, and all that sort of linguistic and, uh, thing, that, that way of expressing the faith. Yeah, uh, because uh, one of the things about the Anglican usage mm. is that the language is very close to the language of the Book of Common Prayer. It is, yes, it is. And uh, that, that is very attractive to many people, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that makes it an, an easier transition into Catholicism for many of your prisoners. Yes, but now, down, I mean, for many of them, I, f I forget where they came from. Uh, and <laughs> some of them have so integrated well into the Catholic Church, you would never know, really. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Now, Sister, one of the things that's also distinctive about your order's transition is that you are not in the Anglican usage, are you? Yes. You are? We have permission to use the Anglican rite. Oh, you, rite. you have permission to use mm -hmm. the Anglican rite. So, so you are also Anglican usage? Yes, but we use both rites. Okay. Well, we actually, the convent hasn't yet used the Anglican rite, mm -hmm. but they have permission. Right, right. Mm -hmm. so, so most of the, your relationship is with the uh, Catholic Archdiocese of Baltimore. Yes. Rather than with the ordinariate. Mm. Yes. 
Yeah, you, you won't be under them. As no, such. it won't be in the, in the ordinary yet at all. And you find, how do you find that as an experience of entering into the church? It's been relatively easy and very nice and very gentle. Mm -hmm. um, there's been no clashes. Mm -hmm. uh, each sister has entered it very differently. Um, my entry was very traumatic. I thought, oh, I couldn't believe this was happening, you know. But yet... Why was that? <laughs> I guess because um, I was formed Anglican. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, that's no longer there. Right. But in 2008, our Reverend Mother seated us all down and she said, I want to, I want to know some answers here. And she said, individually, do you feel like you are being called to the Roman Church? And every sister said yes, except two. And then she went around again and she said, do you feel like the community is being called to the Roman Church? And every sister said yes. So with that, we- Including the two? Yeah. Oh, it's interesting. Yeah. So with that, we contacted the Archbishop of Baltimore and then he started the thing rolling. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, a, a, lot of, a, a lot of us Catholics who are, you know, raised in the Roman Rite, because the, and we want to make it clear, the Anglican usage is part of the Roman Rite. It's part of the Latin Rite, yes. Yeah, it's part of the Western Latin Church, Rite. Yes. So it's, it's, you know, fully integrated into the Latin Rite, but it's got some distinctive ways of praying and the liturgy, and it's very beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I've actually concelebrated at uh, the uh, Our Lady of the Atonement in San Antonio. Yeah. And it's very beautiful. And I've been to uh, your parish yes, you for uh, Stations of the Cross. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it's all, you know, very, uh, I feel quite at home. Yeah. But do you see that this is going to be a transition that eventually fades away? Or will this remain a distinctive community? Well, I think that I, I would like to say that our, the heritage we bring into the church is not merely liturgical. It's, um, it's, it's an English kind of spirituality. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pastoral tradition. It's um, a, a juridical kind of way of doing things, a, a different somewhat from those of the Latin church. And these things will, ha I think, have a perpetual validity and value. And we would want to keep them alive. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that there's, mm -hmm. there's, you know, that's one of the things that we've seen when we have other rites join, mm. you know, especially in the East. You know, uh, over the centuries, many Eastern Christians have joined and mm. formed, you know, their own rite. Uh, and we maintain that. We don't Latinize it, that sometimes mistakes were made and there was Latin, uh, Latinizing of those rites. Mm. But, you know, Latinization of those rites is not a goal. No. You know, it's just like uh, when you're cooking, you want the garlic to stay garlic and the bay leaf to stay a bay leaf. Yeah. Yes. Um, the, uh, the people have thought that the pastoral provision was so-called because it was provisional. It, it didn't mean that. It meant provided no. only. Right. But the, the, uh, the, the ordinariate makes the whole thing much more secure and permanent. Mm -hmm. And this is what the Holy Father wants, we believe. Right. That seems to be the case. Yes. That seems to be the case that he's looking for a permanent structure. Yeah. Sister, speaking of this issue of transition and all, uh, is your order receiving new vocations to to the community now that now that they're fully in the Catholic Church? Is this uh, an order that will continue on, you know, with new vocations, or, or are you closed to new vocations? Oh, no, 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 no. No, we want vocations. In fact, uh, in March, there's um, a young woman coming, mm -hmm. so she'll probably be the first, but we also have two unique um, sisters. They were in enclosed orders uh, in Germany, and they decided that they might like to try us out, so they got permission to stay with us for three years. And then after three years, they each make their decision whether or not they want to stay or go back. And either way, we'll be all right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because you, how long has your community been in the Catholic Church? Since 2009. So it's really only three years. Mm -hmm. So we, we, 
you know, the idea that this community will continue as a Catholic community is very much one of the goals that your community has. Yes, and the worst part of the whole thing is is that our formation program is not completed yet. Oh, is that right? Yeah, we have still to complete that. Well, do it one month at a time. So it's just like <laughs> when you're teaching high school, you stay one chapter ahead of the students. It's <laughs> about what we have to do. Yeah, really, really, yeah. really. And one, one of the things about both of you, and either one of you can respond to this, both Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI have seen in the Anglican tradition some values that they want preserved, you know, and not eradicated. What would some of those, besides hymnody, uh, what would some of those be? Well, people always concentrate on the, on, the, on the liturgical aspects of it. But as I said a moment ago, I think there is a wider, um, a pastoral kind of way of doing things, which is somewhat different from those uh, of the local Latin parish. Um, uh, there's certainly an English spirituality um, pre and you post characterize that? Well, uh, uh, b b b classics like Piers Plowman, like the writings of Walter, William Langland, Julian of Norwich, um, the, uh, Gilbert of Sampringham, uh, John Donne, post-Reformation, George Herbert, the great poet, uh, and, and so on. Both, end, both sides of the Reformation divide. There has been a distinctive English kind of spirituality, mm -hmm. which I think is to be valuable and beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We call it the patrimony. Is that right? Yeah, and we have a, a lot of it that we hope to bring. And I think the Pope wants it, as you said, but I think he also likes Anglicans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think he's, uh, you know, allowing this to easily come in. But it, it's the way we do social work. It's the way we look at social justice. It's everything he said. Um, it's, it's the way we serve people. Um, and in the long run, you can't really define it. It's who we are and what we are mm -hmm. and what has been instilled in us over the years. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. kind of caught and not taught, you know, that kind of thing. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. And, you know, it, one of the things that may, I, I mean, at least I wonder, uh, that may happen is that as you remain inside the Catholic community, that distinctiveness of what you bring from the English spiritual tradition might become more clarified, mm. you know, because English spiritual tradition is not so vital uh, in most Catholic circles. Uh, you know, so much of American Catholicism was dominated by the Irish, mm. and so. Uh, they they have another tradition, yeah. And of course, and then the French and Germans, you know, they have their own traditions. And and somehow the English one has got squeezed out. You see, right? Well, and, and and there's nothing wrong with the Irish. That was by accident. <laughs> yes, it was by accident. Yes. But I mean, the wonderful thing about this whole situation is you mentioned 500 years a moment ago. Uh, f for 500 years, we've wept over the Reformation and the division and the heartbreak of all that. And now, really, for the first time, there are, there are signs of a restoration of unity, the beginnings yes. of a restoration of that unity for which Christ prayed. Exactly. And which is, in fact, essential for the mission of the church. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. I'm afraid we have to take a break, uh, but we want to come back in a couple minutes and get some of your questions and your comments for my guests. So please stay with us.
Thank you. Thank you and welcome back. I just want to start off by giving you some more information. If you'd like to learn more about the personal ordinariate of the Chair of St. Peter, which is the name of the Anglican ordinariate, it's called the Personal Ordinariate of the Chair of St. Peter. You can go to the internet and look up www.usordinariate.org, www.usordinariate.org. And that would be very helpful to find out more information. Also, it's been a very pretty day here today in Alabama. Uh, sun was shining, a little warmer than up in uh, Philadelphia. <laughs> Uh, not as warm as Texas, perhaps. No, it was wet in Texas today. Oh, good. Oh, that's good news. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, glad, glad to hear that it was yeah. wet in Texas. Yeah. You know, it'll, it'll be wet here, too, coming up. Uh, if you got wet rain, then mm. that's good. But, you know, I always rejoice about rain in Texas because they've had such a drought. Yes. But we've got beautiful weather, and we'd love to have you come and join us. If you can make a pilgrimage here to EWTN to be part of our live programs, join us at the masses, get tours of the network, and so on, please contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966. That's 205-271-2966. Or go to our website, www.ewtn.com, and they'll give you all sorts of information about what's going on. Are you all ready for some questions? Yeah. All right, let's start off with a call. I have Eric on the line. Hello, Eric. Hi, Father. Hi, where are you from? Uh, Manchester, New Hampshire. Great. And what's your question? Well, uh, my best friend and I, uh, Steve, we've been praying for his mom for the past 30 years, uh, who's from England, and she is Anglican. And we've been praying that she would convert to Catholicism. Uh, would you know if there's literature uh, that we can give her on this new development in the church? I don't know, but let me ask uh, my guests. It's, it's a very early days as far as the ordinariate is concerned. It was only, in fact, inaugurated on Sunday, but uh, there will be material available. I don't think there's anything I can point to at this moment, but certainly the, uh, the website you mentioned would be a good starting place. Uh, there is a great deal of literature about Anglicans and Roman Catholics and the way in which the Anglican tradition has come into the Catholic Church. Uh, there's one published by the Ignatius Press uh, about, about a, year, a year ago, uh, and I know about it because I wrote the foreword for it. Okay. Uh, but um, th there are books around, yes, and it's difficult just to put your finger on anything new from the ordinary yet. Do you remember the name of that book? That you I wrote the forward to? I thought you'd ask me that. <laughs> I, I, I'm too old to remember that kind of thing. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't remember, but it's published by Ignatius and it's new-ish. And, and it's about the uh, Anglican usage? Yes. Okay. Yes. So if you go to, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ignatius Press and, they, and, and their website, I'm sure you could find it. And yes. there'd be a number of other books, certainly books by uh, Blessed John Cardinal Newman. Oh, yes. Yeah, yes, of course. And, and indeed, I mean, I, people don't believe me, but I, the thing that first started me moving in the right direction was reading Cardinal Newman, uh, Apologia, when I was 14. But that's how about that for precocious? <laughs> yeah, let's see, there you go. And, and that, that book is called The Apologia Pro Vita, Pro Vita Sua. Sua. Yes. Uh, that, that's a, that's a available in paperback yes. from a number of publishers, yes. and you can get that. There are lots of other books by Cardinal Newman. Yes. And also, I would think, I don't know if it, what you would think, but uh, books by people like G.K. Chesterton would also be helpful to understand some of it. I mean, he's, he's dealing with a larger apologetic yeah. Yeah. than a specifically Catholic, but mm. in some of his books, he's dealing with a very specifically Catholic mm. uh, apologetic mm. as well. Yes, you know, sometimes though... Like, like his book, Why I Became a Catholic. Yeah. That oh, would yeah. be a, a good, okay. good book. Mm -hmm. It's a very good book. I was gonna say, sometimes though, uh, people have their own spiritual journeys, and even though we would like them to be Catholic, they might not be ready to be there. Right, right. And so you have to wait for people to come along. Wait for the Holy Spirit, I think. The guy's been waiting for 30 years, sister. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess that mother, God's time, that's yeah. not so long. I don't think the mother is ready, you know? Yeah, it sounds like yeah. it. It sounds like it. But you never know. You never know. It's 
conversion is an amazing process. And I always say, I don't convert anybody. You know, I never convert anybody. Uh, God, conversion is a management question, and God is management. You know, he does the converting, uh, and his graces have to be operative. And I think it, it, it's also true that um, f for many of us, or sadly in some respects, it was not so much that we left Anglicanism as that Anglicanism left us. Left us. Yeah. And that the, 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 that vanishing, the vanishing firm land upon which Anglicans stand is, is, is just dissolving. Mm -hmm. And that becomes available and obvious at some point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, 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 the Anglican Church has done a number of things of changing its doctrine yes. on a number of issues. Well, specifically uh, the ones we're concerned about currently in connection with, with, with birth control, abortion, these things. Right, right. They, mm. In 1930, uh, at the Lambeth Conference, yes. you know, they, they changed the, the doctrine that had been held University from the beginning by, of the church. By, by Christians, really. Right, yes. yeah. right. Mm. And the other Protestant churches followed suit. Mm. Many of them, not all, but many. Yeah. We have a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? I'm from the great state of Minnesota, Father. Great. Welcome to Thaw Out down here. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> that. Sister, I have a question for you. I, uh, I was interested in, in, your, in the clergy. Are you cloistered nuns or do you work in schools and hospitals? Uh, could you explain a little bit about that for us? None of the above. None of the above. No, we, we're not cloistered. Okay. We don't work in hospitals. We don't work in schools. Oh. We're a monastic community. And with being monastic community means that we pray the hours throughout the day. The hours the of the liturgy of the hours. Yes, yeah. the liturgy of the hours throughout the day. Every two or three hours we stop and go to chapel and pray those prayers that are specific for that hour. For all those people who can't get there, who can't pray that often. And so that is our vocation is to maintain that monastic prayer life. And then over and above that, each individual sister gets more prayer time. And then over and above that, or with it, is this mixed um, apostolate. Okay, all right. Let's say we have another caller, John. Hello, Father. Hi, where are you from? Ohio. And what is your question? Well, first the comment, and I told the producer I would do this, I want to thank you for your leadership, Father Mitch, and uh, I don't want anybody to take it for granted. My question to our guests is, uh, now that you have become Catholic, has your view on Blessed Mother Mary changed, and if how, particularly the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption, and I yield to the show. Oh, thank you very much, John. Interesting question. It is an interesting question. Which one would like to start? You, uh, let me start with you, Father, because right. your church is named after our lady. St. Mary, St. Mary the Virgin, yes. I think, first of all, I would want to say that Anglicanism is, is, is really a spectrum of views from Calvinists at one end to, uh, to Papalists at the other end. So you'll find people within the Anglican heritage and tradition who have no problem with any of the Marian doctrines and others who do have problems with them. I always came personally, and my parish came from the papalist end of it, as you might say. So nothing changed as far as what we believed is concerned at all, or the way in which we pray. So there was no problem for us. Sister? Same thing. We had no problem. It was um, rather easy to slide from Anglo-Catholicism into Roman Catholicism. That was relatively easy. And all the Marian doctrines, too. I mean, they came with it, and we had no problem with that. Um, what I've discovered since I've been in the parish is that there are more novenas that we've ever had before <laughs> and more rosaries <laughs> all the time. But Anglicans do rosaries, they pray rosaries, and they pray novenas. But since I've been in this parish, it's more so. Is that right? Mm -hmm. You know, I was just going to ask, um, uh, do uh, um, the sisters as a group find the prayer of the rosary a problem prayer for them? No, but we don't pray it as a group. You don't pray it as a group, no, but, but, but individual been, sisters pray. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. How about in the parish? Uh, we have a rosary group every Saturday morning and at other times too, but there's a rosary group every Saturday morning after Mass, yes. Mm -hmm. oh, that's interesting. And that has not changed. I mean, none of this has changed for us. We always, we always kept the Marian feasts, even as Anglicans. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. We have a question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? 
Ohio. And what's your question? I would like to ask Sister uh, about her work with the poor and the homeless. And in terms of what, what would you like to ask her about it? What they do to try to help the homeless and oh, help okay. them try to uh, find homes or if they find shelters for them. Well, that's a good question because when you work with the homeless, you're always working with inadequate resources. We never have enough of anything. But what we do specifically, we, have, we start with evening prayer. And they kind of filter in from the street because it's cold. Right. So they come into the church for warmth. And then um, they sing and Father gives them a little homily and, you know, it's regular evening prayer. Okay. And then they go upstairs to eat and you always have to feed them because um, you never know when their last meal was. Or when the next one is. Or the next one will be, yeah. And so um, there was a little girl one time who was, um, she was six years old and she was sitting at the table watching the men go get the food. And when it was her table's turn, she went up and she grabbed a great big hoagie and went right back to her seat and sat down and ate the whole thing. And then I realized she'd not eaten that day. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, those are things that break your heart. Right. But anyways, the main thing we do is supply the food and then supply the clothing. And it's the clothing we have the trouble with because we need seasonal clothing. We don't need last summer's clothing now. Right. You know, we need seasonal clothing. And we never have enough jackets. We never do. <clears throat> and we got um, socks, enough for Christmas presents for everybody. And when I say everybody, I'm talking between 180, 185 people. So it's a big droop. But anyway. See, and, and a lot of people don't realize that thing like socks and underwear are commodities that are very important in working with the poor because people usually wear their socks out until they are worn out. Mm -hmm. And you really need to get new socks and T-shirts and underwear and all that right. for the poor. Yeah. Well, anyways, this group gave us enough socks for Christmas present, but Father had given the cook Christmas Day off, but he forgot to hire another cook. So when it came time to feed them, there was no food. I mean, everything was chaotic. So they never got those socks until the next Sunday. But anyways, they did get their Christmas presents. Right, right. Uh, we can't necessarily work for getting them into jobs because we never see the same group twice. Mm -hmm. Like I say, they filter in from the streets. And if they're in that vicinity of the church, then they come in. Uh, it's rare that we would say, see the same person three times in a row. Right, right. So we can't do that work. Um, but there are other programs that do, like there's, an, there's a Roman Catholic sister, Sister Mary Scullion, who has all this intact, and she has the buildings in which to do it with. So she has the whole program organized. But again, you're never working with the amount of people that need the help. Mm -hmm. We're always handicapped in, in that respect. Right. Right, right. That's, that's always one of the difficulties of working with the very poor and de mm -hmm. destitute and homeless. And we try for uh, towels and washcloths and toothpaste and, and deodorant and toilet tissue and, you know, anything that they would need, we try. Right. And that's really basically what we do is fulfill their basic needs. Right, right. All right, let's go to another call. We have David on the line. Hello, David. Hi. Hi, where are you from? Massachusetts. And what's your question? The sister. I had a question for the sister. Sure, go ahead. Um, how, how can you are, you, how are you able to drive a car with that headpiece on your head? And you, I'm sure you can't really see side by side with them. I've been driving, um, well, since I was 16 years old, and of course I put this on when I was 26, and I've been driving ever since. But in Pennsylvania, you have to take a test, uh, a vision test, and you put your, um, head, your head into this machine, and if you can see everything in that picture, then you get your license. So I can see everything in that picture. So I have peripheral vision. Good. So you, you, you can see what's coming up behind you. I can see. Because you, cause you got to watch that blind spot, mm -hmm. you know, when you're driving on either side, you know, the, even got, without a wimple, I have to watch. No, the blind spot, I just sit forward and look in the mirror. Okay. So I've there got you that go. covered, I think. All uh, right, good, 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 good. That's, I, I'd never thought of that. Um, 
by the way, uh, is that the same habit that you had as an Anglican? Yes. Oh, so that you had the same habit mm -hmm. entirely. Yeah. So you've been driving with this for a long time. Yes. All right, there you go. I've twice. never driven with sister, but, I, but her sisters have driven me, and I felt perfectly safe. Oh, okay, yeah. good, good. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still here to talk yes. about it. Yes. <laughs> I have another call. I have Patrick on the line. Hello, Patrick. Hello, Father. Hi, where are you from? Ohio. And what's your question? Oh, I was just checking if a uh, Roman Latin Rite Catholic visited the Anglican Catholic Church and decided that was more suitable to him or her, would he or she just petition the parish priest to join that parish then? They, well, that's what happens, in fact, yes. Um, very early on in our time in the Catholic Church, in fact, even before we joined it, the Bishop of Fort Worth, the late Bishop Delady, came to visit us, and that was one of the first questions that he was asked. If we are cradle Catholics, can we belong to this parish? And he replied that this is a Catholic parish, and of course you belong to it if, if you wish to do so. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's not a problem at no, all. No. Not a problem at all. And, that, and that's, you know, some friends of mine uh, have so fallen in love mm. with the solemnity of the liturgy that the mm. liturgical practice yeah. is very attractive to many people because there's no nonsense. And even the little kids, when, when the liturgy is solemn, even little kids are less fidgety. That's true. Yeah. And, you know, so they, they, they are very, very comfortable and they've, they've, mm. they're cradle Catholics, but they've joined an Anglican usage uh, parish. Mm. They may, they may be less fidgety, but we have so many of them. <laughs> <laughs> Huge numbers of small children, actually. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. That's a good problem to have. Yes. Yeah. We have another call on the line. Hello, Randall. Yes. Hi, where are you from? I'm from Jefferson, Maryland. And what's your question? Well, uh, first of all, a little bit of a comment. When I, I'm an Episcopalian, and a couple of years ago when I first found out that the All Saints sisters were leaving the Episcopal Church, I was a little disappointed, but now I understand and I have actually a shrine set up in my house where on one side I have the Pope and the other side I have the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> and I'm praying that one day we may all be one. And my question is, is for the sisters, how difficult was, them, was it for them to, I mean, I know that they met with the Archbishop of Baltimore and everything, but how difficult was it for them to actually make that transition with the liturgy and the music and, and, and then that sort of stuff. Thank you very much, Randall, for your question. Um, as a whole, I don't really think it was that difficult. As I uh, tried to explain, uh, we were what we call Anglo Catholics, mm -hmm. and Anglo Catholicism has the same doctrines as the Roman Church does. Mm -hmm. So it was just very easy to slide from one into the other. But individual sisters had different responses. And as I said, my own was traumatic. Uh, others were not that traumatic. Others mm -hmm. were very, very joyful, very happy about it, and they just went right in, no problem. Oh, that's great, mm -hmm. that's great. I would like to have asked our caller, um, if he has a shrine in his house and he has the image of the Holy Father, or a picture of the Holy Father on one side, and a picture of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rome Williams on the other, why does he not have an, a replica of or representation of the presiding bishop there of the Episcopal Church? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's, uh, it's that, a rhetorical question. Yes, yes. Yeah. You know, one, uh, <laughs> the other question I would have had is why not get a picture of the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury greeting Pope Benedict oh, yes. when oh, yeah. he came to England. Yes, that would be a nice way it to, would, to would, deal yeah. with that it because they, they apparently got along very nicely, very nicely. Um, you know, we have just a few minutes left, and, you know, one of the things uh, that is distinctive for you, Father, and it might be for you too, Sister, uh, were the sisters allowed to keep their convent? Oh, yes. All right, so, and just like, you, just like you were allowed to keep your parish. Yes. All right, yes. so both of you were able to keep your property yes. mm -hmm. that you had as Anglicans mm -hmm. and come over to the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there any special benefit to being able to keep that property? We've always had it, for one thing, you know, <laughs> all those many, many mm -hmm. years. And we've managed it well the way we had been managing it. Mm -hmm. And the Archbishop said, we don't want it. 
it's still yours. So okay. that's how we handled it. All right. The Anglican Archbishop. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, no, no. Oh, no. the Catholic Archbishop. Archbishop. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. good. There you go. We, we, continuity is, is important, for, especially for any community. We fe felt that the church was something we loved and cherished, and it was home. We really thought when we left the Episcopal Church that we might lose it, in fact. We mm. knew that was a possibility. Uh, but it didn't alter our determination to do what we thought was right. But as it happened, God was good to us and we kept our property. And that was partly because the Episcopal Bishop of the day was sympathetic to us, in fact. And uh, he became a Catholic at his retirement, died just recently, in fact, Clarence Pope. Oh, I remember that. Yes. I remember the, the yes. Anglican Bishop Named Pope. Pope. That's right. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. And, and, and he, he died a Catholic. Yes, he did, just recently, within the last few weeks. God rest his soul. Mm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I remember that because I, I used to live in the Dallas Fort yes, Worth yeah. area, so, yeah. so I remember him, and he was, uh, he was very sympathetic, yes. as I recall. Yeah. Mm. You know, this is, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, I think is very important is to see that there is this. Um, uh, ease of transition mm -hmm. and that uh, it sounds to me as if you both have found the Roman Catholic community welcoming mm -hmm. and not resentful. Uh, and you don't sense the clergy resentful for you because you're, you're married. No. No, no, I, I don't no. sense They're that They're kindly either. and friendly and brothers. Right, right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And, and others, do you have much contact with other sisters? Mm -hmm. I do, but um, I don't find them resentful. I just find them um, not knowledgeable. Oh, okay. Just yeah, a they lack just don't of know about it. Yeah, yeah. right, right. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, one, one of the things about this transition that's been going on in the places I've visited mm -hmm. is that it does seem to be uh, filled with a peace yeah. that is one of the signs of God's activity going on here. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I, I like. I don't find turmoil at all. Mm -hmm. there, were, uh, there are some, uh, some uh, Anglican priests who f would find it very difficult to accept they needed to be, quote, reordained. Right. Um, I, I, this was never a problem for me um, because I was not asked to deny the validity or grace of what had gone on before. Right. It, it, just, it, just, it, it meant that nobody questioned my orders. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid that we have run out of time. Uh, it's gone by very, very quickly. Uh, but I want to thank you both. And Father, if you would join me in giving a blessing to our audience. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And remember, as Michael Warsaw mentioned at the beginning of the show, we need your support. Uh, this network is brought to you by you. So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay all of our bills. God bless and thank you.